I'm delighted to start our new preaching series, Love Is, and it's, it's going to be an adventure, and I can't wait to receive from others who will be preaching on different aspects of love, love is patient, love is kind, and so on. Um, but today I've got the task of introducing this new series, and I better start with where the idea came from. One day I was reading a book called All About Love by the African-American writer Bell Hooks. Um, if I could have the next um, picture, please. Um, she, she died just a couple of years ago, actually. And Bell Hooks taught me something. And it sparked the idea for this whole preaching series. Early in her book, Bell Hooks explains the difference between love and something called cathexis. Please don't let that word put you off. She describes it really well in this quote. So Bell Hooks writes this. Most of us learn early on to think of love as a feeling. When we feel deeply drawn to someone, we cathect them. That is, we invest feelings or emotion in them. That process of investment wherein a loved one becomes important to us is called cathexis. And this immediately resonated with me. Um, and at first I thought, okay, it resonates with me, but what's, what's the problem here um, about talking about cathexis as love? Surely it's a kind of love. Well, Bell Hooks wrote that when we confuse cathexis and love, it can enable a person to feel they love someone, even believe they love someone, while simultaneously treating them badly. Bell Hooks drew on her own experience of growing up in a dysfunctional family where there was lots of shaming and verbal humiliation coexisting with plenty of affection and care. So, so it was like the household was split. How could this happen? Bell Hooks reflected that it was because her family had confused cathexis and love. She herself struggled to even realise that her family was dysfunctional because she felt a great attachment to them and they to her. But that attachment didn't necessarily mean that she'd been loved well. Then later in her life, Bell Hooks found this definition of love from the psychiatrist M. Scott Peck. It's the next one here, thanks. He, he wrote that love is the will to extend oneself for the purpose of nurturing one's own or another's spiritual growth. Love is as love does. Love is an act of will, namely both an intention and an action. Will also implies choice. We do not have to love, we choose to love. And with this definition in mind, Bell Hooks had to admit that she had not felt loved, had not been loved in her household growing up. She had no care, but not love there. She does also say that outside of her household, her grandfather had shown her true love, but that in her household, she hadn't received it. Her basic needs may have been met there, but the core of who she was, her soul, perhaps we might say, had not been nurtured. And when I first read all of this, I felt really sad for the author, for Bell Hooks. But I was also quite shocked uh, and convicted. You know how someone can have a faith crisis? You might have had one, a faith crisis. Well, I had a love crisis on my hands. I started thinking, have I confused perfectness and love? Have I assumed that my warm feelings or attachment are love without considering if my so-called love has actually nurtured the growth of others? That was the question that kind of haunted me and started the idea for this preaching series. I've heard it said that when people read All About Love by Bell Hooks, they soon realise that they are not reading it so much as it is reading them. Have you ever had that with a book? I've had it with the Bible a lot. That I think I'm reading it, but actually the Bible is reading me. And we will get to the Bible shortly. But first, let's just drill down on this idea that we can confuse cathexis and love. Imagine, imagine a marriage, 
an unhealthy marriage perhaps, where say one partner tries to stop the other partner from doing something. Say, stop the other partner from going to the gym because they're worried that that partner will meet someone new there. The controlling partner may say that they're doing what they're doing out of love. But is it love if it obstructs the nurture and growth of the other? The person who uses so-called love to justify controlling and abusive behaviour has likely confused cathexis and love. Because that behaviour isn't loving. It's not loving. They might say it is. They might believe it is. But it's not loving. Let's try another one. Imagine two churches. Two churches. The first is full of like-minded people, where there are lots of warm feelings and attachment between the people, and everyone seems to just get each other. They get each other. It's heavenly. And yet, no one really extends themselves for the good of the other. That's the first church. Okay, the second church. This is a holy hodgepodge of a congregation who would never naturally gravitate to each other outside of the church. And they actually often find themselves in awkward situations and painful miscommunications. But they're working through it. They're reaching out to each other and trying to build relationships. So which church is perfecting? Which is loving? Surely the second one is the one that is actively loving. But it's interesting because the first one will look more loving. It will appear more loving. Visitors who come will find it more loving. But it's actually the second that's doing the hard work of love. One more illustration. Picture a parent and a child. Um, although the parent realises that the child is growing up, the parent is attached to the, the level of dependence that is in the relationship or has been in the relationship. And so that parent unconsciously, completely unconsciously, finds ways of keeping the, the child dependent. And in doing so, the child is not able to grow and flourish. The difficulty is, again, is that the parent believes they're doing it for love, for love, and to meet the child's needs. When actually, it's a big need in the parent that's being met. And by meeting that need, the parent is obstructing love and preventing the child's growth. The parent is confused with excess and love. Tricky business love, isn't it? So one danger is that we might, like the controlling partner or over-attached parent, obstruct love in the name of love. In the name of a love that is actually really perfectus. And another danger is that we might look very loving when actually we're just perfecting. Like the heavenly church that isn't actually engaged in the hard work of love that the Holy Hodgepodge Church is. How do we avoid these dangers? One way is to embrace the idea from M. Scott Peck that love is as love does. Love is more than attachment or warm feelings. Love is a choice to do something. But if love is as love does, what does love do? Thankfully, the most famous words written on this topic happen to be in our Bibles in 1 Corinthians 13. So we're going to hear those words now, and Judith is going to come and read for us. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonour others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, 
It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be still. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. <coughs> when I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now, we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. How, how do you write a love letter to a church behaving badly? How do you write a love letter to a church behaving badly? That was the question that the Apostle Paul faced when he sat down to write or dictate his first letter to the Corinthians. He ends up writing some of the most famous words ever written on the topic of love. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, and so on. And it's so easy to get caught up in the poetic beauty of these words that grace the wedding services of thousands of couples every year. But these words were not written for a loved up couple about to embark on their happy ever after. They were written for a dysfunctional, fractured, badly behaved Christian community in a place called Corinth. And some of these Corinthians, strangely, some of these Corinthians thought they were actually at the peak of spiritual performance when actually they had completely missed the point. So what are they doing, these Corinthians? Do you want to hear what they're getting up to? It'll make you feel better. It'll make us feel better about our church if we hear what the Corinthians were getting up to. Well, firstly, the Corinthian church, they were splitting off into factions. One group saying, I belong to Paul, another saying, I belong to Apollos, another evangelist, church planter, another saying, I belong to Peter, another saying, I belong to Christ. The Corinthian Christians were rallying around particular Christian leaders. Can you imagine that at Worthing Baptist Church? Imagine if, while Mike's on sabbatical, ten people say, well, I'm not coming to church because I belong to Mike. And then 10 other people say, hey, you shouldn't say that, I belong to Peter. And then before you know it, you've got another group that's saying, we don't belong to Mike or Peter, we belong to Frida, and we're meeting in her house. And then another group, oh, we belong to Ant, we belong to Martha, we belong to Billy. Before you know it, we've just got a church in pieces. That was what was going on, something like that was going on at Corinth. Paul describes the Corinthians as puffed up or arrogant. Each group, each faction thought that theirs was the best. Ours is the right one. We've got it right. There's more that's going on in Corinth. I'll go through this really quick, quickly. There's sexual immorality among the Corinthians. One man is sleeping with his father's wife. Others are sleeping with prostitutes. And Paul is trying to say, where is the love there in that? Thirdly, they're talking, they're taking each other to court about issues that could be resolved peacefully within the church. Fourthly, their worship gatherings were chaotic and, and people's spiritual gifts were being used willy-nilly and not being governed by love and order and respect, mutual respect. There's a lot more, but I'll mention just one more because it relates to something that we've done this morning. The Corinthians were abusing communion, the Lord's Supper. We've shared bread and wine together this morning. And this was something that the Corinthians would do too, but they did it a little bit differently. They shared bread and wine as part of a big meal, a bit like the big meal we had a few weeks back. 
So they would have it in the middle of that meal. But some bad stuff was happening at Corinth because um, some would come really hungry and the rich people would bring their own lunch, their own private supper and start tucking into that while the poorer people probably had nothing. And the rich people were getting drunk and the poorer people were just hungry and Paul says to them, that's not the Lord's Supper. If, if, that's, if, if that's how you're doing it, that is not the Lord's Supper. That is an abuse of the Lord's Supper. So he tells them to not arrive hungry, but to eat at home, and then everyone eat together the bread and the wine. They should not fragment their community with their lack of self-control and consideration. So that's just giving you a snapshot of um, what was going on at Corinth. And the strange thing is, is that despite all of that bad behaviour, many of the Corinthian Christians still regarded themselves as wise and as knowledgeable and part of a kind of spiritual elite. The commentator Richard Hayes highlights how, quote, precisely those Corinthians who are most single-mindedly focused on spirituality have become guilty of dividing the community and despising their brothers and sisters. And for Paul, this was all so wrong. Wisdom, knowledge, and spiritual gifts are nothing without love. And that's why he writes, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. I give all I possess to the poor, give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. You see that repeat of the word nothing, nothing, nothing. The Corinthians may feel that they are very wise, very knowledgeable, very spiritual, but if, as Paul believed, those things are in essence all about love, and love is so clearly lacking, at Corinth, then clearly this community has got a big problem. The Corinthians need to learn that love is as love does. And so, Paul pours his words out like water on the house fire that is the Corinthian church. He writes, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonour others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. I'm not going to comment on these, because we're going to look at each one in turn over the next three months. It's clear to see at this point that these words are all about the active character of love. Love is as love does. Again, I'll quote the commentator Richard Hayes. Paul speaks descriptively in praise of love by detailing what love, now poetically personified, does and does not do. And this picture that Paul is painting, sketching out, this picture of love in action, it, it prophetically challenges much of the chaos that's been going on at Corinth. Not least the chaos of worship. That's a big thing for Paul. Paul wants them to know that all spiritual gifts are to be governed by love and used for the edification or the building up of the church. So often these words, they have been uprooted from their context. Spoken of abstractly, theoretically. Have you ever been to a wedding service where these words have been read and then they've been chased up by a sermon on the bad behaviour of the Corinthians? How awkward would that be? Starting a couple of starting their married life, hearing about all this sexual immorality and cock Corinth and, and all the rest of it. That doesn't happen. And so sometimes these words get abstract, they get all theoretical. Um, but actually, we can't forget these people, because 
these, these are the people that Paul is trying to win over. He's really trying to win them over. Try and persuade them with words about love. So we can't forget them, as beautiful as these words are on their own. And the other thing we can't forget is that these words don't say anything about God. Did you notice that? They say nothing about God. But that's not the case for the letter of 1 Corinthians, of 1 Corinthians as a whole. In fact, Paul talks about God all the time. About God as gracious and faithful. God is the one who has called the Corinthians into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ. Paul talks about Jesus as the power of God and the wisdom of God. And also Paul talks about Jesus as the Corinthians' righteousness, holiness, redemption. And above all, Paul talks about Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection as God's victory over sin and death. And a foretaste of the promised end where human beings will be made alive in Christ and death itself will be conquered. That's the big picture. In a way then, Paul's description of love dovetails his description of God. Just as God's love is active in calling, redeeming, saving the Corinthians, the Corinthians' love is not love if it is not active. Love is as love does. So where do we go from here? How can we act on this idea that love is as love does today? The obvious answer is go do something loving. And I please, I don't want to discourage that <laughs> by no means. But since this sermon um, is the intro, it's just the intro, um, there's something we might want to do first. And that is to re-examine what we mean by love. And this is something, this is work that we each need to do. It can't all happen here. Re-examine what we mean when we say love. One issue that we've already looked at is the possibility that we might confuse cathexis and love, that we might think we're loving someone when we're actually just drawn to them and investing feeling or emotion in them. And that can open a door to us believing that we can simultaneously love and treat someone badly. And that wasn't an option for the Corinthians. It's not an option for us either. But another reason why we might want to re-examine love is because has our love, has our understanding of love got a bit too small? You can ask yourself that question. We talk a lot about love here at Worthy Baptist Church, and rightly so. It's the ethical core of the Christian faith. But what are we talking about when we're talking about love? Is it just being nice? Opening doors for people? Have we domesticated love? Is our concept of love emaciated? Is it adequately shaped by the riches of Scripture and the person of Jesus Christ? God can't be contained, domesticated, boxed up, and neither can the love that comes from God. Just like God, love is always more than expected or imagined. And this is good news. Because 1 Corinthians 13 offers a huge picture of love. One that is both rooted in the problems of a particular community, but it's also expansive and timeless. It has the power to expand our view of love over the next three months, if we'll let it. So as I invite Steph and John back, just a couple of questions to take away with you this morning. Have you confused cathexis and love at all? And secondly, are you open to a bigger picture of love, a wider, deeper, higher than you expected love? Are you open to that? Do you have anything more to learn? Or have you already reached the apex of love? So there we go. Our Love Is series has begun. What would it look like? Consider this. What would it look like? What would it look like for us to grow in our capacity to love over these next three months? How will our view of love change, grow, mature, if it will? What new insights might we gain from different preachers and biblical texts that we will hear from? What if we're challenged 
What if we are convicted, surprised, shocked by all of this stuff about love, this bigger picture of love? What aspect of love will particularly stand out to you? What if God wants to do a deep work in us? Will we be open to that? Will we cooperate with that? I, I think God wants to do a deep work in me. And this series is not about me trying to get you somewhere. No way. You may already be the most loving human you can be. I hope you are. But I know God's got some work to do with me. So I need to... I need that deep work. I need God's deep work. I need to cooperate with it. So the question is just, you, do you want to join? Do you want to be part of this? Would you like to be part of this? And a lot's unknown at this stage. Uh, this new preaching series is an experiment of sorts. There are going to be some new preachers who have never preached before. That's great. God's got us. And I'm excited about what we'll see as we go through this week's. Hear these words, some words about God holding us in love. In grace you were created. In mercy you have been sustained. And in love you will be held forever.